The air was thick with the scent of pine as the group of friends made their way deeper into the woods, the distant hum of civilization fading into nothingness. Mark, Sarah, Jake, and Emily were excited for a weekend getaway, far from the distractions of daily life, seeking peace and quiet under the vast canopy of stars. Their camping trip was supposed to be a relaxing break, just a simple retreat into nature. But they didn't know that the woods around them had a history, one that the locals whispered about in fear. It started like any other camping trip, with laughter and stories around the campfire. Jake cracked jokes about the creepy forest as Sarah roasted marshmallows, her face illuminated by the flickering flames. They felt safe, even as the fire's warmth faded into the cold, crisp night air. Mark, the most cautious of the group, had brought along a survival kit just in case, but he didn't expect to need it. Not here. Not now. As the evening wore on, Emily noticed something odd. The woods around them, which had seemed alive with the sounds of crickets and rustling leaves, suddenly grew unnervingly quiet. The usual hum of nocturnal creatures had ceased, leaving an oppressive silence hanging in the air. She glanced around the camp, her eyes meeting Mark's. He had noticed it too, the unease in the air, but he didn't say anything. The others, caught up in their conversation, hadn't noticed the change. Let's go for a night hike, Jake suggested with a grin, eager to explore. I'm up for it, Sarah said, already standing and brushing dirt from her pants. Maybe we should stay close to camp, Mark said hesitantly. But before he could argue further, the others were already gathering their things. Emily hesitated, but eventually stood to follow. She didn't want to be the odd one out, but something in her gut told her that leaving the safety of the campfire might not be the best idea. They grabbed their flashlights and set off into the woods, the beam of light cutting through the thick darkness. The trees stretched like towering giants, their twisted branches reaching toward the sky. The path was narrow, overgrown with weeds and brambles, but they pushed forward following Jake's lead. Hey, I think I saw something move up ahead, Emily said, her voice barely a whisper. She had seen something, a shadow, flitting between the trees. Jake laughed it off. Probably just a deer or something. Don't get spooked, Emily. But the unsettling feeling remained. The deeper they went, the more Emily's skin prickled with discomfort. She wasn't sure what it was, but she felt as if they were being watched. Mark, sensing her discomfort, stayed close behind her, glancing nervously around. Maybe we should turn back, Mark said, but Jake, ever the adventurer, was undeterred. No way. We're just getting started, he called back. This is when it gets good. They pressed on until the forest seemed to open up into a small clearing. At first, it appeared to be just a peaceful spot, but as they shone their flashlights around, the scene grew more disturbing. The ground was littered with strange symbols drawn in the dirt, crude markings that resembled ancient runes. Emily's breath caught in her throat as she noticed something else. Small, rusted items scattered about. Broken chains, a torn piece of fabric, and what looked like a decayed skull. What is this place? Sarah whispered, her voice filled with disbelief. Let's go back, Mark insisted, his voice tinged with panic. The air felt thick, oppressive, as if something unseen was pressing in on them. But before anyone could move, the hairs on the back of Emily's neck stood up. A sound, soft but unmistakable, came from the trees behind them. It was a slow, dragging noise, like something heavy being pulled across the ground. Jake swung around, his flashlight c cutting through the darkness. Who's messing around back there? He called out, his voice challenging. But there was no answer. The silence that followed was deafening, and, and then the sound came again, this time closer. It was the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, as if someone or something was stalking them from just beyond the light's reach. We need to go! Now! Mark yelled, his fear now palpable. Without waiting for anyone to respond, he turned and bolted down the narrow path they had come from, pushing through the underbrush. Emily, Sarah, and Jake followed, their hearts pounding in their chests. But the further they ran, the more they realized something was wrong. The path they had taken seemed to stretch on forever, twisting and turning in unnatural ways. They should have been back at the camp by now, but no matter how fast they ran, the woods seemed to go on and on. And then they saw it. A figure emerged from the trees, standing just ahead of them. It was tall, impossibly tall, with long, thin limbs that twisted in unnatural angles. Its face was obscured, covered in a hooded cloak that seemed to absorb the light from their flashlights. The air grew colder, and Emily's breath fogged in the air as she stared in horror.
The figure didn't move, didn't speak. It just stood there, watching. In that moment, everything inside Emily screamed to turn and run, but her legs wouldn't obey. Her mind went blank, frozen in terror. The figure raised one arm, pointing toward the path ahead, toward the dark unknown. No, don't, Mark shouted, pulling Emily back. But it was too late. They had already gone too far, and the woods seemed to have closed in around them, trapping them in its ancient grasp. Suddenly, a crackling sound pierced the silence, the unmistakable sound of a fire crackling, distant but close enough to hear. The group turned, and in the distance, they saw it, their campfire burning brightly as though it had never gone out. We're not far from the camp, Sarah said, relief flooding her voice. They turned and began running, desperate to return to the safety of the fire. But as they reached the clearing, they stopped dead in their tracks. The camp was gone, the tents, the fire, everything was just gone. In its place, there was nothing but an eerie stillness. Where is it? Jake's voice cracked. Where's our camp? The figure, now standing just behind them, let out a low, guttural laugh, one that sent chills through their bones. It echoed through the woods, hollow and menacing. And then it spoke. You should never have come here. Before they could react, the ground beneath them shifted, and the world around them seemed to distort. The forest closed in, the trees bending as though they were alive. The shadows grew darker, longer, and they realized with a sickening certainty that they were never going to leave. The last thing Emily heard was the sound of distant laughter, a mocking echo that would haunt her forever. And then everything went dark. It was supposed to be a quick overnight camping trip, just a single night under the stars to unwind from the stress of work. Michelle had been hesitant to join her boyfriend, Eric, on the adventure, but his enthusiasm had convinced her. It's just one night, he'd said, grinning. No cell phones, no distractions, just us and nature. They chose a remote spot deep in the Black Hollow Forest, an area known for its sprawling beauty but less traveled paths. The deeper they went, the more the cell signal vanished, replaced by the rustling of leaves and distant animal calls. By the time they set up their small tent in a clearing surrounded by towering pines, the sun was already slipping beneath the horizon, casting long, spindly shadows across the forest floor. The first hour was peaceful. They roasted marshmallows over a crackling fire and shared stories. But as darkness fully descended, the forest seemed to shift. The cheerful chirping of birds and hum of insects faded into an unnatural silence. Even the fire, once comforting, seemed small and fragile against the oppressive blackness surrounding them. I don't like how quiet it is, Michelle said, glancing around nervously. It's normal, Eric reassured her, though his voice lacked conviction. Predators like wolves or cougars could be nearby. Smaller animals go quiet to avoid being noticed. That didn't comfort her. Instead, it made her hyper-aware of every sound. The faint crackle of the fire, the soft crunch of their footsteps as they moved around the campsite, the occasional rustle of leaves in the distance. Eric wandered off to collect more firewood while Michelle stayed near the tent, fiddling with her flashlight. She felt exposed, her back to the vast, unknowable darkness of the trees. She turned the flashlight on and off nervously, its weak beam barely cutting through the shadows. Then she heard it, a faint, rhythmic tapping. It came from the forest, steady and deliberate, like someone knocking on wood. Tap, tap, tap. Eric, she called, her voice trembling. The tapping stopped. Silence stretched thin and heavy, and Michelle felt the hairs on her arms rise. She called again, louder this time. Eric, stop messing around. It's not funny. The snapping of twigs behind her made her spin around, flashlight shaking in her hand. The beam caught movement, something tall and pale slipping between the trees. It wasn't Eric. Whatever it was moved unnaturally, its limbs too long, its gait almost fluid. Michelle's breath hitched. Eric, she screamed, backing toward the tent. A moment later, Eric emerged from the opposite side of the clearing, a bundle of firewood in his arms. What's wrong? Why are you yelling? There's someone out there, Michelle cried, pointing into the woods. I saw them. Eric dropped the wood, his face tightening. He grabbed his flashlight and scanned the tree line, but there was nothing. The forest stood silent unyielding. You're probably just spooked, he said. He kept his light trained on the trees. It could, could have been a deer or something. Michelle shook her head. No, it wasn't an animal. It was human-shaped, but wrong. Eric hesitated, then shrugged. Let's just stay close to the fire, okay? We'll be fine. They sat by the fire, but the tension between them was thick. 
Michelle couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, and Eric's eyes kept darting toward the forest, his earlier confidence clearly fading. As the night dragged on, the tapping returned. This time it was louder, closer. Tap, tap, tap. It echoed through the clearing, coming from multiple directions. Eric grabbed the small hatchet they'd brought for chopping wood and stood up. Who's there? He shouted, his voice cracking slightly. The tapping stopped again. The fire dimmed, the shadows around them deepening. Then came the whispering. Soft, unintelligible murmurs drifted from the trees. It sounded like multiple voices, overlapping in a chaotic symphony, speaking a language neither of them recognized. Michelle, get in the tent, Hent, Eric said, his voice low and urgent. What about you? Just do it. She obeyed, crawling into the tent and zipping it closed. She clutched her flashlight and a small camping knife, her heart pounding so hard it felt like it might burst. Outside, Eric stood by the fire, the hatchet clenched tightly in his hand. The whispering grew louder, the voices now interspersed with low, guttural growls. Michelle peered through a small opening in the tent and saw them, shapes emerging from the forest. At first, she thought they were people, but as they stepped into the flickering light, she realized how wrong she was. They were impossibly thin, their skin pale and stretched tight over their bones. Their faces were devoid of features, except for dark, hollow eyes and mouths that stretched too wide, filled with jagged teeth. There were at least six of them, circling the clearing. Stay back, Eric shouted, swinging the hatchet wildly. The creatures didn't flinch. They moved closer, their bodies twitching and jerking unnaturally. One of them let out a low, eerie laugh, a sound that made Michelle's blood run cold. Suddenly, one of the creatures lunged at Eric. He swung the hatchet, connecting with its arm, but instead of blood, a thick black ooze spilled out. The creature didn't scream or recoil. It simply grabbed the hatchet with its other hand and snapped it in half like a twig. Eric stumbled back, tripping over the firewood. The other creatures closed in, their movements faster now, more aggressive. Michelle couldn't take it anymore. She unzipped the tent and screamed, Eric, run! But it was too late. The creatures swarmed him, dragging him to the ground. His screams were muffled by the sound of their growls and wet, tearing noises. Michelle turned and ran into the woods, branches whipping at her face and arms. She didn't stop, didn't look back, the sound of the creatures' laughter following her. She tripped and fell multiple times, her flashlight slipping from her hand, but she didn't care. She just needed to get away. Finally, she burst out of the forest and onto a dirt road. She flagged down a passing car, her clothes torn and her face streaked with tears. The driver, an older man, took her to the nearest police station. When she told them what happened, they didn't believe her. They organized a search party, but all they found was the campsite, abandoned. There was no sign of Eric, no sign of the creatures, just the broken hatchet covered in black ooze. To this day, Michelle refuses to go near a forest. She knows Eric is gone, but sometimes late at night she swears she hears the tapping. Tap, tap, tap. The cabin in the woods had stood abandoned for decades, its wooden frame leaning like a forgotten corpse. Locals whispered about it, but never ventured close, claiming it was cursed. For Jason, Maya, and Rob, three college friends eager for a Halloween thrill, the warnings only fueled their curiosity. The plan was simple, spend one night in the cabin, record their experiences, and prove to their friends back home that the so-called curse of Red Hollow Cabin was nothing more than a myth. The hike up to the cabin was uneventful, but eerie. The path twisted through dense, overgrown trees that seemed to block out the sun, though it was only late afternoon. The trio reached the clearing just as the last light faded, leaving the sky bruised and dark. The cabin loomed before them, its windows shattered, its roof sagging under years of neglect. A single warped wooden door creaked in the faint breeze. The air was heavy, carrying a faint metallic tang that made Maya shiver. Let's get this over with, Jason said, forcing a laugh as he pushed the door open. It groaned on rusted hinges, revealing the dim interior. The air inside was stale, thick with the scent of decay. Dust-coated furniture sat untouched, and cobwebs clung to the corners like delicate shrouds. Cozy, Rob muttered, setting up his camera. Maya crossed her arms, glancing at the boarded-up windows. Why do I feel like we're being watched already? Jason chuckled. Because you're letting the stories get to you. It's just an old cabin. Nothing to worry about. As the night deepened, the friends settled into the main room, where a decrepit fireplace stood as the centerpiece. 
They lit a lantern and placed it on the floor, the warm glow barely penetrating the oppressive darkness. They took turns recounting the legend of the cabin. Supposedly, in the late 1800s, a man named Elias Red had lived there with his wife and daughter. One brutal winter, the family had vanished without a trace, and when search parties arrived weeks later, they found the cabin empty, except for strange symbols carved into the walls and a pool of blood that refused to dry. Over the years, others who stayed there reported hearing whispers, footsteps, and, in some cases, seeing the shadowy figure of a man with empty, glowing eyes. Spooky, Jason said with a grin, tossing a piece of wood into the fireplace. But come on, it's just a story. Rob leaned into the camera. So far, no ghosts, just three idiots in a creepy cabin. Maya, however, couldn't shake the feeling of unease. The longer they stayed, the heavier the air felt, as if the cabin itself were alive, breathing, watching. She ran her hand over the nearest wall and froze. Beneath the layers of dust and grime were faint carvings, symbols that matched the ones from the legend. Guys, she called out, her voice shaking. Look at this. Jason and Rob came over, their flashlights illuminating the carvings. They were jagged, almost violent, etched deep into the wood in erratic patterns. Some resembled twisted faces, others symbols that seemed to shift when stared at too long. Okay, that's creepy, Rob admitted, stepping back. A sudden thud echoed through the cabin, making all three jump. It sounded as if something heavy had fallen upstairs. What was that? Maya whispered. Jason grabbed a flashlight. Probably just an animal. I'll check it out. Are you serious? Maya hissed. This isn't a horror movie. We stick together. Fine, Jason said, though his bravado was clearly faltering. The three of them ascended the narrow staircase, each step groaning under their weight. The second floor was worse than the first. The walls were warped and the air was colder, biting through their jackets. They checked the first two rooms, finding nothing but broken furniture and more carvings. Then they reached the third room. The door was slightly ajar, and as Jason pushed it open, the flashlight beam revealed something that made them all stop. A child's wooden rocking chair sat in the center of the room, gently rocking back and forth, though there was no breeze. That's not normal, Rob whispered, backing up. The air grew colder, and a faint sound began to rise. A child's laughter, high-pitched and echoing, gua, though it seemed to come from all around them. Let's go, Maya said, her voice trembling. Now. As they turned to leave, the door slammed shut with a force that rattled the walls. Jason yanked at the doorknob, but it wouldn't budge. From the shadows of the room, a figure began to take shape. At first, it was just a smudge of darkness, but as the flashlight beams caught it, the figure became clearer, a tall man with hollow eyes that glowed faintly in the dark. His face was gaunt, his skin stretched tight over his bones, and his mouth twisted into a grotesque grin. Who are you? Jason stammered, his voice barely audible. The figure didn't speak. Instead, it stepped forward, its movements jerky and unnatural, as if it were a marionette controlled by invisible strings. The child's laughter grew louder, overlapping with a woman's sobs and the deep, guttural growl of something inhuman. Maya screamed as the figure lunged toward them. Jason and Rob threw themselves against the door, which suddenly flew open as if the cabin itself were mocking them. They tumbled down the stairs, the sound of heavy footsteps thundering after them. Get to the car, Rob shouted, grabbing his camera as they fled. The three of them burst out of the cabin, the night air icy against their flushed faces. They didn't dare look back as they sprinted through the forest, the shadows seeming to twist and reach for them. The laughter and sobbing followed them, echoing in the trees. When they finally reached their car, Jason fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking so badly he dropped them. Maya snatched them up, unlocking the doors, and they piled in. The car roared to life, and Jason floored it, the tires spinning in the dirt before catching traction. As they sped away, Maya glanced in the rearview mirror. The cabin stood dark and silent, but in the window, she saw them. Elias Red, his wife, and their daughter, watching with hollow eyes. The friends didn't speak as they drove back to town. They never uploaded the footage. A week later, Rob's camera disappeared, along with the memory card. And every night since, Jason, Maya, and Rob have dreamed of the cabin, its dark corridors, and the family that waits inside, whispering for them to return. The storm rolled in faster than expected, and by the time Trevor, Laura, and Sam realized they were lost, the rain was coming down in sheets. What had started as a casual weekend hike in the remote stretches of gray pine forest turned into a desperate search for shelter. Their phones had no signal, 
and the trail markers had vanished hours ago. Through the pounding rain and flashes of lightning, Laura spotted it first. A building, barely visible through the dense trees. There! Over there! She shouted, her voice barely audible over the storm. The three of them trudged through the mud and foliage, finally reaching the structure. It was a dilapidated house, its wooden frame sagging with age, the windows boarded up haphazardly. Vines snaked along the walls, and the roof looked as though it might collapse at any moment. Better than being out here, Sam said, shaking water from his hair. He pushed the creaking door open and ped, and the three of them stepped inside. The interior was dark, the only light coming from occasional flashes of lightning. The air was damp and cold, and the smell of mildew was overpowering. The house appeared abandoned, but it was unnervingly intact. A few pieces of furniture were still in place. A wooden chair, a table with one leg shorter than the others, and a cracked mirror on the wall. Trevor set his backpack down. We'll wait out the storm and head back in the morning. This place isn't great, but it'll do. Laura nodded, though she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The house was too quiet, the kind of silence that felt deliberate, oppressive. As they explored, Sam called out from the next room. Guys, come look at this. They found him standing in what must have been the living room. A fireplace dominated the far wall, its mantle covered in a thick layer of dust. Above it hung a large, faded portrait. It depicted a family of four. A stern-looking father, a delicate mother, and two children, a boy and a girl, both with solemn expressions. The painting was old, its colors muted, but that the family's eyes seemed unnaturally sharp, almost lifelike. That's creepy, Laura said, stepping closer. Who leaves a painting like this behind? Trevor tilted his head. Does it look like their eyes are following you? Sam snorted. Okay, don't start. It's just a painting. They turned their attention back to the rest of the house, finding little of interest. The kitchen was bare, save for a few rusted utensils and a single plate on the counter. Upstairs, they found two bedrooms, both stripped of belongings but with the beds still made. As the storm raged outside, they decided to settle in the main room by the fireplace. Trevor managed to find some dry wood near the house and started a small fire. The warmth was a relief, but it didn't chase away the unease that clung to them. Hours passed, and the storm showed no signs of letting up. The three of them took turns trying to sleep, though the creaks and groans of the old house made it difficult. It was during Laura's turn to keep watch that she first heard it, a faint sound like footsteps on the floor above. She froze, straining her ears. The noise came again, slow and deliberate. Trevor, she whispered, shaking him awake. I think someone's upstairs. He sat up groggily, rubbing his eyes. What? Are you sure? Laura nodded, her face pale. Listen. The footsteps continued, moving back and forth. Sam woke up as well, and the three of them huddled close, staring at the ceiling. It's probably just the wind, Sam said, though his voice wavered. Wind doesn't sound like footsteps, Laura snapped. Trevor grabbed the flashlight and stood. I'm checking it out. Are you insane? Laura hissed. Better than sitting here scared out of my mind, Trevor replied. He headed for the staircase, the flashlight beam trembling as it illuminated the narrow, creaking steps. Reluctantly, Laura and Sam followed him. The upstairs hall was eerily quiet, the air colder than it had been earlier. The door to the children's bedroom was slightly ajar. Trevor pushed it open slowly, the flashlight sweeping the room. Nothing. Just the bed, the empty wardrobe, and the peeling wallpaper. See? Nothing, Sam said, trying to sound confident. Then the footsteps came again, but this time, they were behind them. The trio spun around, the flashlight beam catching only the empty hallway. The sound continued, moving toward the master bedroom at the end of the hall. The door creaked open, though none of them had touched it. Trevor, Laura whispered, we need to leave. Now. But Trevor stepped forward, his curiosity overriding his fear. He entered the master bedroom, the other two reluctantly following. The room was barren except for an old, ornate mirror leaning against the far wall. The glass was cloudy, its surface warped, but as Trevor shone the flashlight on it, the reflection didn't match their movements. In the mirror, the family from the painting stood behind them, their eyes glowing faintly, their expressions twisted into malicious grins. Laura screamed, and the mirror shattered, the sound echoing through the house. The pieces of glass scattered across the floor, but the reflection of the family lingered for a moment longer before fading away. Suddenly, the entire house seemed to come alive. The walls groaned, the floor buckled, and a deafening roar filled the air. Trevor grabbed Laura and Sam, pulling them toward the stairs.
As they descended, the house seemed to fight against them. The stairs splintered and the front door slammed shut. Shadows darted across the walls, accompanied by whispers that grew louder, angrier. They reached the main room, only to find the portrait above the fireplace had changed. The family was no longer seated. Instead, they stood at the edge of the frame, reaching out, their eyes filled with rage. Trevor yanked at the front door, which finally gave way. The three of them stumbled out into the storm, rain pelting their faces as they ran without looking back. When they finally made it back to the trailhead, soaked and trembling, the sun was beginning to rise. The storm had passed, leaving behind an eerie stillness. But when they turned to see if the house was still visible through the trees, there was nothing there, only an empty clearing where the house should have been. The plan had been simple, a late-night drive through the remote outskirts of town, just for the thrill of it. Rachel, Mike, and Jenny piled into Mike's old sedan, their laughter filling the car as they sped down the winding, desolate roads surrounded by thick woods. It was a stupid, reckless tradition they called ghost runs, fueled by urban legends and teenage boredom. But that night, their casual fun turned into something else entirely. They had heard whispers of an unmarked road in the area, known among locals as Devil's Fork. The road was infamous for leading nowhere, just a narrow, twisting dirt path cutting through the woods, shrouded in mist even on dry nights. People claimed those who ventured down it sometimes didn't come back, and those who did came back. Different. Mike, ever the thrill-seeker, insisted they find it. Come on, what's the worst that could happen? We get scared? Big deal. Jenny wasn't so sure. It's called Devil's Fork, Mike. Doesn't that set off any alarm bells in your head? Rachel, seated in the back, grinned nervously. Let's just check it out. If it's creepy, we can turn around. The three of them laughed, though unease hung in the air as they drove deeper into the woods. Finally, they found it. A break in the trees with an unmarked dirt path leading into darkness. The headlights illuminated the signless post at the fork's entrance, and the atmosphere seemed to shift instantly. The laughter stopped. Even Mike hesitated. Let's do this he said after a pause, his voice quieter than usual. The car bumped and rattled over the uneven path. The forest grew thicker, the tree branches overhead intertwining like skeletal fingers, blocking out the moonlight. The mist came in fast, curling around the car like it was alive, and the dirt road narrowed until the woods on either side seemed to press in on them. After ten minutes of silence, Rachel spoke. Does it feel like we've been driving in circles? Mike frowned. What do you mean? It's a straight path. No she insisted, leaning forward. The same tree. I've seen it three times now, the one with the weird hollow trunk. I swear. Jenny glanced out her window, her unease growing. She's right. I've seen it too. Mike tightened his grip on the wheel. It's just your imagination. There's no way. The car sputtered, then lurched to a stop. What the hell? Mike muttered, turning the key again. The engine whined, but refused to start. He slammed the steering wheel in frustration. Great. Perfect timing. Can you fix it? Rachel asked, her voice trembling. Mike shook his head. I don't know. I'll check under the hood. As soon as he stepped out, the air seemed heavier, the night unnaturally still. Even the usual sounds of the forest, crickets, rustling leaves, were gone. Mike opened the hood, but as he fumbled with the engine, he heard it. Faint whispers, so quiet he wasn't sure if they were real. Guys, he called, glancing over his shoulder. Do you hear that? Rachel rolled down her window. Hear what? Shh. He strained to listen, but the whispers faded into the mist. Shaking his head, he returned to the engine. Probably nothing. Inside the car, Rachel and Jenny sat tensely, their eyes scanning the trees. That's when Jenny noticed something, or someone, standing far off the road. It was a figure, just barely visible through the mist, motionless and staring. Mike, she hissed. Get back in the car. What now? he asked, exasperated, but when he turned, he saw it too. The figure was tall, impossibly thin, its head cocked at an unnatural angle. It didn't move, but the longer they stared, the closer it seemed. Mike scrambled back into the car, slamming the door. What the hell is that? Rachel locked her door. I don't know. Just, just try the car again. Mike turned the key, and miraculously, the engine roared to life. Relief washed over them, but as the headlights came on, the figure was gone. Drive, Jenny whispered. Now. Mike didn't need to be told twice. The car sped down the narrow path, its tires kicking up dirt. But the mist grew thicker, swallowing the beams of the headlights. 
The road seemed to stretch endlessly, and no matter how far they drove, there was no sign of an exit. Why aren't we getting out of here? Rachel cried. I'm trying, Mike shouted, panic rising in his voice. It's like... He stopped mid-sentence, slamming on the brakes. The car skidded to a halt, and they all stared in disbelief. The figure was back, standing in the middle of the road, closer now. Its face was pale, featureless, except for a pair of deep, hollow eyes that glowed faintly. And this time, it wasn't alone. More figures emerged from the trees, each identical, their hollow eyes fixed on the car. They moved in unison, their limbs jerking unnaturally, closing in. Back up! Jenny screamed. Mike threw the car into reverse, but the figures were behind them now, blocking the path. They were trapped. The whispers returned, louder now, a cacophony of voices speaking in a language none of them recognized. The car's interior grew cold, their breath visible in the air. The windows fogged over, and on the glass, handprints appeared, small, delicate, and impossibly many. Rachel started to cry. What do they want? Want. The figures pressed closer, their faces brushing against the windows, their hollow eyes peering inside. The whispers grew deafening, the sound drilling into their skulls. Then, in a sudden jarring silence, all the windows shattered at once. The last thing Rachel saw before the darkness consumed her was one of the figures reaching for her, its cold, skeletal fingers wrapping around her arm. The next morning, local authorities found Mike's car parked at the entrance of Devil's Fork. The car was empty, its windows shattered, the seats covered in muddy handprints. There was no sign of Rachel, Mike, or Jenny. All that remained was a single message, scratched into the hood of the car. You came, you stay. It was supposed to be a fun experiment in solitude, 24 hours alone in an abandoned asylum. For Ethan, a rising influencer hungry for more subscribers, it seemed like the perfect way to boost his channel. Ghost hunting with Ethan had been gaining traction, but he needed a video that would go viral. Spending a night in the infamous Blackthorn Asylum was exactly the kind of content his audience craved. The asylum, built in the early 1900s, had been shut down decades ago after reports of abuse, mysterious deaths, and a massive fire that gutted half the building. Locals called it cursed, warning anyone foolish enough to enter. Ethan dismissed the stories as exaggerated folklore, perfect fodder for his stream. He arrived just before dusk, armed with his camera, a flashlight, and a small backpack of supplies. The building was a crumbling monolith of cracked stone and shattered windows, its silhouette jagged against the fiery sunset. The air was heavy, damp with the scent of decay and rain. Here we are, Ethan said into his camera, his voice steady despite the nerves creeping up his spine. Blackthorn Asylum, a place of tragedy, terror, and, if the legends are true, a whole lot of angry spirits. He pushed open the rusted gate and stepped inside. The entry hall was cavernous, the ceiling high and adorned with peeling paint. Ethan's footsteps echoed unnervingly, the sound swallowed by the oppressive silence. He panned his camera around, narrating as he explored. Here's the reception area. Pretty sure they didn't hand out lollipops here, he joked weakly. His flashlight caught rows of rusted wheelchairs and crumbling gurneys, the remnants of a place where hope had long since died. An hour passed as he wandered the halls, documenting graffiti-streaked walls and dusty furniture. Despite the eerie atmosphere, nothing particularly scary happened. The livestream chat lit up with comments teasing him for the lack of action. Patience, Ethan told his viewers. Ghosts don't work on a schedule. He decided to set up camp in the asylum's notorious East Wing, where, according to urban legend, the fire had claimed the lives of dozens of patients. It was said their screams could still be heard echoing through the charred walls. Ethan found a room that seemed relatively intact, its door hanging slightly ajar. Inside, there was a single metal bed frame, its mattress rotted away. He sat down, adjusting his camera for better angles. All right, guys, he said. Let's see if we can make contact. If there's anyone here with me, make a noise. For a long moment, there was nothing but the hum of silence. Then, faintly, the sound of a door creaking echoed from down the hall. Ethan's heart skipped. That could have been the wind, he muttered to himself, though there was no breeze in the stagnant air. He grabbed his flashlight and stepped out, the camera catching his every move. The hall stretched into darkness, the beam of light barely penetrating the void. If that was you, he called out, do it again. A loud clang reverberated from behind him. Ethan spun around, his pulse pounding. 
The metal bed frame he'd been sitting on moments ago was now in the center of the room, though he distinctly remembered leaving it against the wall. Okay, he whispered, his voice trembling. That's... that's new. The chat exploded with excitement. As the night wore on, the activity grew stranger. Footsteps echoed in empty halls. His camera flickered intermittently, capturing brief, shadowy shapes that disappeared the moment he turned to look. At one point, he swore he felt something brush past him, cold and, and fleeting, but the most disturbing moment came at 3.13 a.m. Ethan was exploring the lower level, where the asylum's morgue and solitary cells were located. The air grew colder as he descended, the smell of damp earth and mildew intensifying. Guys, he whispered into the camera, this place is next level creepy. The morgue was just as terrifying as he'd imagined. Rusted autopsy tables, cabinets filled with shattered glass, and rows of empty body drawers. He opened one drawer halfway, the screech of metal echoing like a scream. As he turned to leave, his flashlight flickered again. In that brief moment of darkness, he heard it, a raspy voice, close and guttural, whispering his name. Ethan. He froze, the flashlight trembling in his hand. Who's there? He shouted, his voice echoing off the walls. The reply came immediately, louder this time. Ethan. He backed away, his heart hammering. The voice seemed to come from everywhere at once, surrounding him, suffocating him. Then the body drawer he'd opened slammed shut with enough force to rattle the room. That was enough. Ethan bolted up the stairs, his breath ragged, his camera shaking in his grip. He wanted out. But the asylum wasn't done with him. As he raced through the labyrinth of halls, the shadows seemed to shift and writhe, forming shapes that stretched toward him. The whispers returned, growing louder, overlapping until they were a deafening chorus of unintelligible words. He turned a corner and stopped dead. The door to the entrance hall was gone. What the hell? He gasped, spinning in place. The walls seemed to close in, the space warping unnaturally. He backtracked, but every path he took led him deeper into the asylum. It was as if the building itself were alive, rearranging to trap him. His camera caught movement ahead a figure standing in the center of the hall that silhouetted against the faint glow of his flashlight. It was a man in a hospital gown, his head tilted unnaturally to the side. As Ethan watched, frozen in terror, the figure took a single jerking step forward, then another, and another. Ethan turned and ran, his mind blank with fear. The figure's footsteps thundered behind him, impossibly fast, the sound growing louder with each second. He reached a room and slammed the door shut, bracing it with his body. The footsteps stopped. Uh, for a moment, all was silent except for his ragged breathing. Then, slowly, the doorknob began to turn. Ethan screamed. The live stream ended abruptly at 3.47 a.m., cutting off mid-scream. When authorities searched Blackthorn Asylum the next day, they found Ethan's camera lying in the entry hall. The footage was intact, but there was no sign of Ethan. On the final frame of the video, as the camera lay on the ground, a single message was scrawled across the cracked wall behind it, written in what looked like soot. He never left. The mountains were supposed to be their getaway, a weekend of hiking, laughter, and disconnecting from the world. Julia, Mark, and Kevin had been friends since college, and the sprawling wilderness of Red Hollow Ridge seemed like the perfect spot to escape their busy lives. They arrived on Friday afternoon, setting up camp near a crystal clear lake surrounded by towering pines. It was beautiful, serene, untouched, but something about the silence felt unnatural, as though the forest were holding its breath. That first night, as they sat around the fire, Julia noticed it. The air, normally filled with the sounds of insects and nocturnal creatures, was dead quiet. Even the crackle of the fire seemed subdued. Is it just me, or is it too quiet? She asked, her voice low. Mark smirked. City girl can't handle the peace, Kevin chuckled. Relax, Jules, you're imagining things. Julia tried to laugh it off, but unease crept over her as she scanned the darkness beyond the firelight. The woods felt watchful. The next morning, they decided to hike up to a viewpoint several miles from their campsite. The trail was narrow and steep, winding through dense forest. As they climbed, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. Julia wasn't the only one noticing it this time. Anyone else feel like we're not alone out here? Kevin asked, wiping sweat from his brow. Mark shrugged, though his eyes darted nervously to the trees. It's probably just deer or something. But it wasn't deer. Halfway to the viewpoint, Julia froze. Did you hear that? The others stopped, listening. At first, there was nothing. 
Then it came, a faint rhythmic sound like someone knocking on wood. Knock, knock. It echoed through the forest, growing louder, closer. The three of them exchanged uneasy glances. Woodpecker? Mark suggested, though his voice lacked confidence. No way, Kevin whispered. That's too deliberate. The knocking stopped abruptly, replaced by a chilling silence. They waited, hearts pounding, but nothing else came. Shaking it off, they continued, their banter subdued. By late afternoon, they reached the viewpoint. The breathtaking vista momentarily eased their tension. They snapped photos, shared snacks, and even laughed a little. But as the sun dipped lower in the sky, the oppressive feeling returned. We should head back, Julia urged. It'll be dark soon. Mark nodded and they began the descent. The trail, which had seemed straightforward earlier, now felt disorienting. The trees looked different, unfamiliar, the shadows stretched unnaturally long, and the air grew colder with each step. Are we lost? Kevin asked after an hour of walking. No, Mark insisted, though his tone betrayed him. We just need to keep going. The knocking returned. This time it was louder, surrounding them from all sides. Knock, knock, knock. Julia's breath hitched. What the hell is that? Kevin spun in a circle, his flashlight darting through the trees. Who's out there? He shouted. The forest answered with silence. Then, in the distance, they saw it. A figure standing among the trees. It was barely visible in the fading light, motionless, its silhouette unnervingly tall and thin. Let's go, Julia said, her voice trembling. They quickened their pace, trying to ignore the figure that seemed to reappear every time they glanced back. No matter how far they walked, it was always there, just beyond the trees. Night fell, and their flashlights barely pierced the dense darkness. The trail was gone, swallowed by the forest. Panic set in as they realized they were hopelessly lost. Let's just stop and wait for morning, Julia said, her voice shaking. We're only making it worse. Reluctantly, they agreed, setting up a crude camp in a small clearing. No one wanted to admit it, but none of them planned on sleeping. The knocking started again, louder than ever. Knock, knock, knock. Okay, I'm done with this, Mark said, standing. Whoever you are, knock it off. The knocking stopped. For a brief moment, the silence was almost worse. Then came the whispering. Low and guttural, it rose from the darkness, too faint to understand, but undeniably there. Julia clutched Kevin's arm. Mark, sit down. Don't. Before she could finish, Mark's flashlight caught something just beyond the clearing. It was the figure. Closer now. Its limbs were impossibly long, its head tilted at an unnatural angle. Run, Kevin whispered. They bolted, crashing through the underbrush, their flashlights bouncing wildly. The forest seemed endless, the trees pressing closer, their branches clawing at their clothes and skin. The whispers followed them, growing louder, more frenzied. Julia tripped, falling hard. When she looked up, the figure was inches away. Its face, or what passed for one, was featureless except for two deep, hollow voids where its eyes should have been. It reached for her with hands too many jointed, fingers like claws. She screamed, scrambling backward as Kevin and Mark pulled her to her feet. Together, they ran until their lungs burned and their legs gave out. When dawn broke, the three of them found themselves on the edge of the forest, their clothes torn, their bodies battered. They didn't speak as they stumbled back to the car, too shaken to process what had happened. But as they drove away, Julia glanced in the rearview mirror and froze. Standing at the tree line, just barely visible in the morning light, was the figure, watching, waiting. The road through Blackbriar Woods was a shortcut, a seldom used gravel path that slashed hours off the drive to the cabin. Sophie and Liam had taken it before, but only during the day. This time, they were running late the sun already dipping below the horizon as they entered the dense forest. The canopy above swallowed the last rays of light, plunging them into an eerie twilight. Are you sure about this? Sophie asked, gripping the door handle. It's fine, Liam replied, though his knuckles whitened on the steering wheel. We've done this a million times, it's just a road. But the road felt different that night, the silence oppressive. No birds, no birds, no insects, just the crunch of tires on gravel and the faint rustling of leaves in the wind. Half an hour in, the headlights caught a sign nailed to a tree. It was old and splintered, the words barely legible. Turn back, Sophie stiffened. What the hell is that? Probably some prank, Liam muttered, though his voice lacked conviction. They drove on. The forest seemed to grow darker, 
denser, as if the trees were closing in. Sophie checked her phone. No signal. We're almost through, right? Another 20 minutes, maybe, Liam said, but even he didn't sound sure. Then, they saw it, a figure standing in the middle of the road. Liam slammed on the brakes, the car skidding to a halt. The figure didn't move. It was tall and gaunt, wrapped in what looked like a tattered cloak. Its face was obscured by a hood, but Sophie swore she could feel its gaze. Stay in the car, Liam whispered, his voice barely audible. But before he could move, the figure stepped back into the woods, vanishing into the shadows. Liam exhaled sharply, probably just some weirdo trying to scare us. Sophie didn't respond. She couldn't shake the feeling that the figure hadn't walked away, that it had, it had melted into the forest, becoming part of it. They drove on, their nerves fraying with every mile. The forest seemed endless now, the trees gnarled and ancient, their roots clawing at the edges of the road. The gravel path grew rougher, the car jolting with each bump. Then the engine sputtered. Don't do this to me, Liam muttered, twisting the key in the ignition. The engine whined, but refused to start. Are you kidding me? Sophie snapped, panic rising in her chest. Liam cursed under his breath, stepping out to check under the hood. Sophie stayed inside, her eyes scanning the dark trees. The silence was unbearable. Then she saw movement, a flicker of white between the trees, there and gone. Liam, she hissed, rolling the window down. Hurry up. I'm trying. He snapped, slamming the hood shut. I don't. The knocking started. It was soft at first, barely audible. Knock! Knock! Sophie turned, her breath catching. The sound came from the rear window. Slowly, she craned her neck, but there was nothing there. Liam, she said, louder this time. Knock! 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 The sound came again, this time from the side of the car. Sophie's heart raced as she fumbled for the lock. Get in the car! Liam didn't argue. He jumped in, slamming the door behind him. The knocking stopped. For a moment, all was still. Then, from the darkness, came a voice, low and raspy like wind through dead leaves. Why are you here? Liam threw the car into neutral, turning the key again and again until the engine roared to life. He didn't care about the bumps or the potholes. He floored it, the car bouncing violently as they sped down the road. But no matter how far they drove, the forest didn't end. This isn't right, Sophie whispered. We should have been out by now. The voice returned, this time inside the car. You shouldn't have come. Sophie screamed, her eyes darting to the back seat, but it was empty. Liam glanced at her, his face pale. Did you hear? The headlights flickered, plunging them into brief moments of darkness. In those flashes, Sophie saw them. Figures lining the road, their faces pale and hollow, mouths open in silent screams. Don't stop, she begged, clutching Liam's arm. I'm not, he shouted, sweat dripping down his face. The road ahead twisted unnaturally, sharp turns appearing out of nowhere. The trees seemed alive now, their branches stretching across the road like skeletal arms, clawing at the car. Then the car came to an abrupt stop. What's wrong? Sophie cried. Liam shook his head, frantically trying to restart the engine. I don't know. It just... The figures were back, surrounding the car. Dozens of them, their hollow eyes glowing faintly in the dark. They pressed closer, their hands smearing the windows with blackened streaks. The voice returned, louder this time. Leave. But leave one behind. What does that mean? Sophie whispered, her voice trembling. Liam stared at her, horror dawning in his eyes. No. No way. The figures began pounding on the car, the sound deafening. The windows started to crack, spiderweb fractures spreading across the glass. We don't have a choice, Sophie cried. Do something. Liam grabbed her hand, his grip tight. We stick together. No one's staying. The pounding stopped abruptly. The forest fell silent. The figures were gone. The engine roared to life on its own. Liam didn't question it. He slammed the gas pedal, the car lurching forward. This time, the forest began to thin, the twisted trees replaced by younger ones. The gravel road smoothed out, and before they knew it, they were back on the highway. Neither of them spoke for a long time, the events were playing in their minds like a nightmare they couldn't wake from. But as they pulled into the cabin's driveway, Sophie glanced at the back seat and froze. There, etched into the fogged glass of the rear window, were three words, one of you. It started as an impulse decision. Matt had been scrolling through local travel forums when he stumbled on a post about the Pine Haven Trail. It was described as remote, unmarked on most maps, and teeming with legends. Locals whispered about strange disappearances, shadowy figures in the trees, and voices that lured hikers off the path. To Matt, it sounded like the perfect thrill, 
he convinced his girlfriend Emily to join him, despite her protests. She wasn't superstitious, but she wasn't exactly eager to tempt fate either. Still, Matt's enthusiasm was infectious, and the thought of a secluded hike was appealing in its own way. They packed light, snacks, water, flashlights, and set out just after sunrise. The entrance to Pinehaven Trail was overgrown, barely a suggestion of a path winding into the forest. A weathered signpost leaned precariously to one side, the words, Enter at your own risk, barely legible under years of grime. Charming, Emily muttered, Matt grinned. Come on, where's your sense of adventure? The forest was unlike any they'd hiked before. The trees were unnaturally tall, their twisted branches blotting out the sun. The deeper they went, the quieter it became. The usual sounds of the forest, birds, rustling leaves, distant insects, were conspicuously absent. It was as if the woods were holding their breath. Doesn't this feel... off? Emily asked after an hour of walking. It's just quiet, asked Matt said, though he couldn't deny the uneasy feeling creeping up his spine. He checked his phone, no signal. He brushed it off as typical for a remote area. But the unease grew. The trees seemed to lean closer together, their gnarled roots snaking across the ground like veins. Matt stopped abruptly, holding out an arm to halt Emily. Do you see that? He whispered. Ahead, partially obscured by the shadows, stood a figure. It was motionless, facing away from them, its outline faint in the dim light. Hello? Matt called. The figure didn't move. Emily grabbed his arm. Matt, let's go back. It's probably another hiker, he said, though he didn't believe his own words. Let's just walk past. As they stepped closer, the figure vanished. One moment it was there, the next, it was gone, as if swallowed by the forest. Did you see where they went? Matt asked. Emily didn't respond. She was staring at the ground where the figure had been standing. There were no footprints. The earth was undisturbed, as though no one had ever been there. They pressed on, though Emily's unease had turned into outright fear. Matt tried to reassure her, but his own confidence was waning. The forest seemed to shift around them, the path twisting in ways that didn't make sense. Landmarks they'd passed earlier reappeared ahead of them as if they were walking in circles. I swear we've been here before, Emily said, her voice trembling. No, we're making progress, Matt lied, but then they heard it, a voice, soft and melodic, calling from deep within the trees. Help me. Emily froze. Did you hear that? Matt nodded. Someone might be in trouble. Or it's something else, Emily shot back. Matt, please, let's leave. But the voice came again, more insistent. Please. I'm lost. Against Emily's protests, Matt turned toward the sound, leaving the path and pushing through the undergrowth. The further they went, the harder it was to see, the light fading unnaturally fast. The air grew colder, and the trees seemed to close in, their branches scraping like claws. Matt, stop! Emily pleaded, grabbing his arm. This isn't right. Before he could respond, the ground beneath them shifted. They tumbled down a steep embankment, landing in a shallow ravine. Matt groaned, brushing dirt off his jacket, but his complaint died in his throat when he saw what lay before them. The clearing was littered with remnants of camping gear, torn tents, rusted lanterns, and scattered clothing. Everything was old, covered in moss and dirt, as if it had been abandoned for years. But that wasn't the worst of it. In the center of the clearing stood a tree unlike the others. Its bark was blackened and cracked, oozing a thick, tar-like substance. Embedded in its trunk were dozens of items, watches, wallets, keys, and photographs, all pressed into the bark as though they'd grown there. Emily stepped closer, her hand trembling as she picked up a photo lying on the ground. It was faded, but she could just make out the faces of two smiling hikers. Matt, she whispered, her voice quivering. This is from last year. Remember those hikers who went missing? It's them. Matt's stomach dropped. He remembered the story. A couple had vanished while hiking in Pine Haven. No trace of them was ever found. Before he could respond, the voice returned, louder now, almost mocking. Help me. It was coming from the tree. The ground beneath them began to tremble, and a low, guttural sound emanated from the blackened bark. The oozing substance began to spread, pooling at the base of the tree like blood. We have to go, Emily shouted, tugging at Matt's arm. But Matt was frozen, his eyes locked on the tree as faces began to form in the bark, twisted, anguished faces, their mouths open in silent screams. One of them looked like the man from the photo. The tar-like substance surged forward, coiling around their feet. Emily screamed, yanking Matt backward as the black ooze tried to pull them toward the tree. Run! She yelled. They scrambled up the embankment, slipping and clawing at the dirt. 
The voices grew louder, more frantic, overlapping in a cacophony of desperate pleas. Don't leave me. Help us. It's coming. Uh, they didn't stop until they burst out of the forest and onto the main road. Their breaths ragged, their faces streaked with dirt and tears. When they reached their car, the forest behind them was silent once more, as if it had swallowed everything that had happened. Matt and Emily didn't speak as they sped away, their only thought to put as much distance as possible between themselves and Pine Haven. But weeks later, as Emily sorted through her backpack, she froze. At the bottom of the bag was a photograph, one she hadn't packed. It was of her and Matt, standing in the clearing by the blackened tree, and behind them, barely visible in the shadows, was a figure. The cabin in Crow Hollow was supposed to be their escape, a secluded getaway for Laura, Ben, and their golden retriever, Max. They wanted isolation, a break from the noise of the city, and this remote rental seemed perfect. Tucked deep within the forest, miles from the nearest neighbor, it promised peace and quiet. The drive there was uneventful, though the forest grew darker and denser as they approached. When they finally reached the cabin, the sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows over the clearing. The structure was rustic, its wooden exterior weathered and covered in moss, but it had charm. Laura noticed it first, an odd pattern etched into the doorframe, almost like runes. What do you think that is? she asked, tracing the grooves with her finger. Probably just decoration, Ben said, unloading their bags. Old cabins like this always have quirks. The first night was uneventful. They unpacked, cooked dinner, and played cards by the fireplace while Max dozed by their feet. The forest outside was eerily quiet, but Laura figured it was because they were so far from civilization. She fell asleep to the crackling of the fire, feeling the kind of calm she'd been craving. The second night was different. They were sitting on the porch, watching the stars, when Max suddenly perked up. His ears stood straight, and he let out a low growl, staring into the woods. "'What's wrong, buddy?' Ben asked, patting his head. Max didn't respond. He just kept growling, his eyes fixed on something they couldn't see. "'Probably a deer,' Laura said, though she couldn't shake the unease that crept over her. But Max didn't settle. He barked sharply, then bolted off the porch, disappearing into the trees." Max, Ben yelled, grabbing a flashlight. Laura followed, her heart pounding. They ran after him, the beam of the flashlight slicing through the darkness, but Max was nowhere to be seen. Then they heard it, a faint rhythmic tapping sound, like someone knocking on wood. It came from deeper in the forest. Max? Laura called. The tapping stopped. They stood in silence, straining to hear anything. Then, faintly, came the sound of Max's bark, but it wasn't right. It was distorted, echoing strangely, as if coming from far away and underwater. Let's go back, Laura urged. We'll find him in the morning. Ben hesitated, but nodded. They turned and made their way back to the cabin, every rustle of leaves making them jump. When they reached the porch, Laura froze. The door was open. I locked that, she whispered, her voice trembling. Ben stepped inside cautiously, flashlight raised. The cabin was exactly as they'd left it, except for one thing. Max was sitting by the fireplace, staring at them. His eyes reflected the light oddly, and his posture was stiff. Max! Laura cried, rushing to him. But as she got closer, she stopped. Something was wrong. His fur was damp, and there was a faint smell of decay. When she reached out to touch him, he didn't move. Ben! She started, but Max suddenly stood and walked toward the door, his movements jerky, almost mechanical. He stopped at the threshold, looked back at them, and let out a bark that sounded more like a human scream. They didn't sleep that night. Max stayed outside, pacing the clearing, his glowing eyes visible through the windows. Occasionally, he would stop and stare at the door, his head tilting at an unnatural angle. What is happening? Laura whispered, clutching a blanket around her. I don't know, Ben said, holding a fire poker like a weapon. But that's not Max. As dawn broke, Max disappeared into the woods. They debated leaving immediately, but Ben insisted on finding him, or whatever was pretending to be him. They ventured out reluctantly, following the path Max had taken. The forest felt different in the daylight, but not safer. The trees seemed taller, their trunks warped and gnarled. The air was heavy, and the strange knocking sound returned, echoing faintly through the woods. They found the first sign about a mile in, Max's collar, torn and hanging from a low branch. The second sign came shortly after. A pile of bones, old and yellowed, arranged in a crude circle. 
We need to go back, Laura said, her voice shaking. Ben nodded, but as they turned, they saw it. A figure stood among the trees, partially obscured by shadows. It was impossibly tall, its limbs thin and elongated, its head tilted as if studying them. In its hand, it held something familiar. Max's leash. Laura grabbed Ben's arm. Run. They bolted, crashing through the underbrush, the sound of footsteps following close behind. The knocking grew louder, almost deafening, and the forest seemed to shift around them, the trees blurring and twisting. When they finally burst into the clearing, the cabin was gone. The space where it had stood was empty, the ground covered in fresh moss. This can't be happening, Ben gasped, spinning in circles. The knocking stopped. Then came a voice, soft, raspy, and close. You should not have come. Laura screamed as the ground beneath them began to shift, roots rising and coiling around their ankles. They struggled, but the forest held them fast. From the shadows, the figure emerged, its face featureless save for two dark hollows where its eyes should have been. It raised one spindly finger and pointed toward the trees. There, half buried in the earth, were two more figures, motionless, lifeless, and identical to Laura and Ben. The search party found their car three days later, parked on the gravel road with no sign of its occupants. The cabin in Crow Hollow was never found, and the forest remained quiet, as if guarding its secrets. But every now and then, hikers in the area report hearing strange knocks in the woods, followed by the sound of a dog barking, distant, distorted, and far too human.